Thank you very much, everybody. So, good morning, Democrats. My name is Ariel Papaji, and I'll be your program director today. The reason for that is probably because I was the biggest fan girl of the Zondo Commission, um, but also hopefully because I am a foe of state capture. So, a year ago today, can you believe it? A year ago already, and wearing a very different hat, our Chief Justice Raymond Zondo handed over some light reading material to President Cyril Ramaphosa. And what a year it's been. 5,500 pages. Or as the Secretary to the Commission, Professor Itumale Mosala, one of our hosts today, explained to me a petabyte of information. A petabyte, I said to him. 400 million Bibles of data, he said. Imagine Johannesburg about three times the size of that. So very welcome to the Chief Justice and to the former chairperson of the Commission of Inquiry to State Capture, Raymond Zondo, to our Higher Education, Science and Technology Minister, Dr. Blade Nzimandi. You've got your hands very full, sir, so we very much appreciate your time here. To our host and CEO of the HSRC, Professor Sarah Mosweza, for curating an essential conversation to the former judges Richard Goldstone and Johan Krichler, very welcome to you. The list is very long, I can see looking around me, but you are all very warmly greeted on this midwinter morning. We gather to assess whether the processes of state capture have been sufficiently disrupted to de-risk our almost 30-year-old democracy and what discussions we have for you today. So to kick us off, I call on Professor Nanya Bolamula, the Divisional Executive at the HSRC in the Essential Developmental Capable and Ethical State Division. Very welcome to you, Prof. Thank you very much, um, Feriel, for your warm welcome. Um, I wish to greet you all as well on this uh, cold Pretoria day. Uh, we hope that you feel welcome. We hope that you enjoy this day, this very momentous and special day that we are celebrating today. It is a year, as Feriel has said, and since Chief Justice Zondo handed over the first volumes of the Commission's report to the President, Cyril Ramaphosa. In an act of transparency, those very volumes were then released simultaneously to the public. Good thing they weren't exactly bite-sized pieces, but we did receive every time the President received the volumes the public was able to read them as well. And I think that we can congratulate both the Commission and the Presidency for that level of transparency that we saw during the time of the Commission. We are honored to have with us our Minister of Higher Education, Science and Innovation, Dr. Bladen Zimande, our keynote speaker, Chief Justice Zondo, the Chief Executive Officer of the Human Sciences Research Council, Professor Sarah Mutsuetza, and the Chair of the Human Sciences Research Council Board, Dr. Cassius Lubisi, as well as former Constitutional Court judges, Johan Krichler and Richard Goldstone. We really started everything for us on the first bench of the Constitutional Court. This room is filled with important people, and I want to acknowledge the presence of each and every one of you, including the young people who are here with us today. We hope that you learn a lot from this experience, as we will, I am sure. This colloquium looks back on the years of state capture and corruption, and the hearings that exposed 
it in all of its seediness and filth. But in the main, it focuses on the future. Where are we going? What has changed our trajectory? Has it changed? And is our democracy at risk? As stated by our Chief Justice, I am quite sure that corruption has no place in a constitutional democracy. It deprives people of services that they are entitled to, and we have to find mechanisms and ways to stop it, to bring it to an absolute minimum. And I think that that's what we need to think about going forward, how to bring it either to a close or to an absolute minimum. Great minds are here with us today who will share their thoughts, and we hope to create a space for deeper reflection about what we mean when we talk about a developmental, capable, and ethical state. Our aim is to provide evidence-based research and commentary on how to strengthen democracy through transparent governance, accountable leadership, and reinvigorated public participation and civic engagement. In his new book, Zondo at Your Fingertips, Paul Holden, who gave evidence at the Commission, identifies eight ways in which the Commission changed South Africa. Resources were deployed in ways that unmatched since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It exposed a political reality that cannot be obscured or denied. The Commission was truly globally unique. It was a really powerful centralized node to draw in investigative capacities of the state. There are concrete results. It was an act of unparalleled and quite radical transparency. And the Commission's approach to civil society was a breath of fresh air. Besides acknowledging these significant changes and calling for our state capture perpetrators to be in orange, to be brought to book, we must go even further to build a state and a society that puts people and the planet at the center. The state plays an important role in shaping politics, economic and social life and in guiding its developmental trajectory. In the past few decades, in particular, the South African state has faced several challenges that has frustrated its stated objective of building a democratic and inclusive society based on the principles of the Freedom Charter. Looming large in recent years, the revelation of state capture have cast a deep shadow on the capacity of the state as a whole to ensure better life for all who live in this beautiful country. This has called into question the legitimacy of the state as well as that of the constitution and has led to diminished trust in democracy and in the constitutionally established institutions meant to uphold democracy. Turmoil within the governing party and the shift towards coalition politics have complicated the nation's political landscape and raised additional questions about the configuration of our state and society at large. The state has struggled to cope with all sorts of things outside of its control, economic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, low economic growth, alarming levels of youth unemployment, gender-based violence and femicide, gangsterism, a global rise in food, water and energy security and increasing conflict across the world. These developments have exposed deep seated and systemic problems with which we must grapple along with continued corruption, fighting continued corruption and the uncomfortable presence of its perpetrators who still occupy positions of influence and power. We cannot afford to be complacent or to lose hope. Our hope, I believe, still lies in our constitution, not only as a legal document, but a testimony to transformative thinking and aspirations underlaid by values and principles that we should all hold dear. 
loose talk of a constitution that has failed us, of democracy that has failed us, is quite frankly disingenuous and dangerous. South Africa needs a mass campaign by civil society, business, the media, and, and political organizations, we, the people, to increase knowledge and understanding of the role of the constitution in order to thwart the campaign by the corrupt, the incompetent, and the populist to blame the constitution for our socioeconomic ills. The Human Sciences Research Council administered social attitude survey has shown that there is a profound lack of knowledge amongst South Africans about the constitution and even about the commission, as we will hear later. We need to create awareness. We need awareness campaigns and we need education campaigns. We need even at the level of early childhood development, primary, high school and tertiary education levels to teach the values of the constitution, which will boost our sense of ownership over the constitution that birthed our democracy. Chief Justice Zondo and the commission were able to do their work precisely because the constitution provides an enabling framework for such endeavors. Clearly, for those who wish to pillage and plunder the coffers of the state, the constitution is a hindrance. Let it remain so. In the words of the late Justice Ismail Mohammed, who wrote so beautifully, the South African constitution retains from the past only what is defensible and represents a decisive break from and a ringing rejection of the part of the past that is disgracefully racist, authoritarian, insular, and repressive. A vigorous identification of and commitment to a democratic, universalistic, universalistic, caring, and aspirationally egalitarian ethos is expressly articulated in the Constitution. The contrast between the past which it repudiates and the future to which it seeks to, to commit is stark and dramatic. The break between the past and the future. It is the future which occupies our minds today. One that is starkly and dramatically different from the past. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nania, for that ringing message of hope. I find that the narrative that it's all going to hell in a handbasket is really not healthy for our country, and I hope that today can be future-focused and solutions-oriented. Our first speaker, our next speaker, I apologize, is Dr. Blade in Zimande. Dr. Blade in Zimande, as we know him, is obviously the Higher Education Science and Technology Minister. But for our purposes today here, he's also a philosopher, a political leader, a communist, and a deep thinker. And I highlight, <laughs> and I highlight that identity just to remind us that it was the Communist Party which, which first put this notion of state capture into the public minds and gave us a literacy by which to understand what was happening to our country. Very welcome, sir. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Feria. Uh, I was hoping that, Sarah, Professor Moswets, I'm going to find a more user-friendly podium here, <laughs> since the HSRC is one of my entities. When I became minister, you should have uh, just lowered this a little bit. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't want only my hair to be seen by the audience. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me start by thanking you, Program Director Feria, and of course, special greetings to our Chief Justice, uh, Raymond Zondo. I must also say that I've seen some other justices here, uh, Justice Krichler and uh, Justice Goldstone, who uh, was the first and the last Cup Commission that I appeared before <laughs> as a matter of interest in Peter Marisbeck City Hall in the early 90s. 
Let me also greet our Director General of the Department of Science and Innovation, Dr. Philip Joaka, uh, Dr. Kesias Lubisi, the Chair of the HSRC Board, uh, Professor Sarah Mosweza, the CEO of the HSRC, as well as my special advisors who are here, Dr. Swartz and Mr. Nava Mandela, uh, Professor Mkwebi Sintlejana of the Department of Politics and International Relations at UJ, Professor Itumele Mosala, I don't know whether to call you former, you were correcting me that you might, we are just not, maybe just not as yet a former secretary of the commission, because we are still doing a lot of work. Uh, Advocate Vusi Pikoli, uh, <clears throat> senior advisor and our former NDPP, uh, Dr. Telezi, the executive director of Public Affairs Research Institute. All government officials who are here and all other participants who are here, including representatives from the, my other entity, the CSIR. I'm very delighted to be joining you today to make these opening remarks on such an important occasion. The Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture, corruption and fraud in the public sector, I must get the name right, before then I use it shorthand, the Zondo Commission, uh, has produced enormous amount of data, which in fact can be and is being used for investigations and prosecutions, which indeed it must. But of course for us, the Commission goes beyond this. The data, which is more than a petabyte in size, should be available to anyone who has an interest in the contents of the report and its supporting evidence and further research. The Commission through Professor Mosala approached my Department of Science and Innovation late in 2020 with the blessing of the Chairperson Chief Justice Zondo. At that time to say, can we ensure that these records are stored properly also so that they are properly available for research? Because sometimes there's a big difference between a report of a judicial commission and preparing it also to be accessible for research. We are more than pleased and happy, Chief Justice, that we are going to be playing this role as this department. <laughs> I also do want to say also that <clears throat> When we accept this role that we are being asked to play, it's because whether we like it or not, what is contained in the Zondo Commission is part of our history, unpalatable as it may be, but it's part of South African history. And therefore, it's a record that we need to use appropriately. This is perhaps, without digressing, the most important commission after the TRC. Without digressing, when we are asked to play a role in keeping the record of this commission and making it accessible to, for research, I'm also being reminded, by the way, about, I've been thinking about the state of the TRC records. Where are they? Are they being properly stored? Have they been mined? in terms of research. Now, I'm asking this question to my Director General of the Department of Science and Innovation, because I think we also need to intervene in that, because that's a very important report. For instance, one of the things I'm arguing is that part of our work in looking at, as researchers now, in looking at the Zondo Commission record, is also to identify gaps that we need to fill. There may be, for purposes of prosecution, but they may be for posterity, for the truth to be told. For instance, one of the big gaps in the TRC and in the history of our country is the role that the media played in its complicity in the atrocities of the apartheid regime, particularly mainstream media. Unfortunately, they refused to participate in the TRC. To me, that's a gap and a story that still needs to be told because we must not allow these gaps so that we deprive our country of our own history. Research is still needed on this. And therefore, what we are launching today through this colloquium must ensure that we do not allow these gaps 
to happen. Hence the importance of your theme of linking what is contained to the report to the task of consolidating our democracy, which is very important. Now, I'm here as a minister, but also I am a minister who has a particular history. I am a former academic, participant in the struggle against apartheid, as well as a participant in the task of reconstruction and rebuilding and transforming our country. So some of the questions that I would like to pose today that are in my mind are also informed about that. Some of the key questions that uh, we should be asking arising out of the Zondo Commission report or reports. The first key question is what are the gaps that needs to be filled on state capture? Because the report, the commission did its best and we really appreciate the work that it has done, but are there still gaps as I was illustrating with the TRC, the gap on the role of the, of the media? TRC also, there are still glaring gaps. Who killed the Craddock for? The details around the assassination of Chris Arnie have never come out in full, and the TRC says so. Research can play a very important and should play an important role. As I say, even if it's not for prosecution, but for posterity, for completing our own history, this is very important. Now, there's also been an argument, by the way, or a narrative, if one were to use today's language, about post-colonial histories and what happens to post-colonial societies, especially in the African continent? So there's this narrative that after 20 years of liberation or independence, things go wrong. I reject that narrative. There's nothing inevitable about a heroic struggle like ours, which was supported by millions of people worldwide against apartheid, that it actually goes wrong. Why? So we must not use fashionable narratives to analyze this. We must actually do concrete analysis of concrete situations and information that we have. And one important source of that is the report of the Zondo Commission. So that we answer, I don't believe that things go wrong just. The Zondo Commission helps us to understand what went wrong and why. And it is the task of researchers to actually uh, tell the story, which is very important. Sometimes I ask this question differently about our own struggle against apartheid. How come was such an expensive struggle became so cheap and sold and bought as contained in the commission's report? Those are questions that we have to ask. So it is very important, therefore, that this becomes a living, a living document or set of documents uh, that should actually be able to help us tell our story. However, history, by the way, is not just about the past. To define history in terms of only the past is not to understand history. History is both about the past, the present, and the future. Again, the importance of your theme about posing questions about our democracy. How do we strengthen our democracy by not allowing in future such things as contained in this report uh, that we must not allow them to happen? And it's often said, any society that doesn't understand its history does not have a future. That is why I'm saying, unpalatable as this report is, it is part of our history and we must treat it like that. Now, what lessons, therefore, can we learn now going forward, looking at the forward looking uh, of the, in terms of the history that we have? Firstly, is the South African situation a unique one? Which means also we'll have to do some serious comparative work and analysis so that we learn from others, but also we teach others 
through our own experience. That's going to be very important. And so that all those sections of humanity who are committed to a genuine, better life for all are able to share these experiences so that such things do not happen again. Now, in taking forward the contents of this report or reports, it will also be important, by the way, to also do a critique of the report itself. Now, Chief Justice, as a judge, you will understand this, you know, judges can be ruthless in coming to a conclusion, you know, and in analysis, you know, what nonsense, they don't use that language, but what nonsense is this that you have brought before me, you know, and so on. We also, as researchers and academics, we have that habit, it's a good habit. For instance, one critical question we need to ask about what is contained in the report, to what extent is our adoption of the Washington Consensus as a country from 1996 laid the basis for state capture? It's a question that is worth asking. How can we come from such a hugely unequal society and think that an unfettered free market is going to correct the inequalities that we actually inherited? It's a very serious question that we need to ask. If I had appeared before you, Chief Justice Zondo, I would have presented this question, for instance, and say, there's a context, I haven't come to report anyone. I've just come to try and, and give this, this particular context. Of course, I know that judges don't like some people who just come with speculation, analysis. They, they even use the word, sometimes, that's moot. We are not interested in that. We're interested in the facts before us. But for us as researchers, that's the question that we actually need to ask. Is there no connection? I'm even interested, by the way, for researchers to look into the interconnection between what is contained in the TRC and what is contained in the Zondo Commission report. Because it's an important part of telling our own history so that we understand where we are. Chief Justice, my own critique, by the way, one of my own critiques of some of the assumptions I see Professor Mosala embedded in the report is that it tends to assume that where the state has failed, the private sector can correct. Now, I have a problem with that because corruption often always involves both the public and the private sector. It's a partnership, it's a combination that is always there. So we also need to examine that, you know, quite, quite critically as researchers, as part of enriching, not as part of rubbishing. I don't want to be, you know, I don't think that we should actually rubbish. Anyway, whoever tries to rubbish the commission as reflecting a part of our own history won't succeed. It's not to rubbish the commission, but also to enrich the work and allow us to actually uh, do something better. Now, let me move in conclusion to say this. I want to state here, Professor Mosala, especially because my DGs is here. You know, one thing nice about being a minister, a Chief Justice, is that you can just instruct your officials here in front of everyone and they are committed. <laughs> we must set aside some money from our departments to support research into the findings of the Zondo Commission. <laughs> Including DG, the establishment of one or two research chairs using our National Research Foundation. We'll not be able to provide all the money that will be needed, but I commit that Chief Justice, we will make a financial contribution. Uh, on that score. Let me conclude then once more by thanking yourself, Chief Justice. I appreciate that you took time away from your very busy schedule to be with us here and also thank uh, the HSRC and the CSIR for organizing this, including yourself, Feria, uh, for agreeing to chair this. Of course, we've got some experience. You wrote a book about this and also to thank my DG, my advisors, and all the participants who are here today. It's unfortunate I'm not gonna, going to sit through today, uh, throughout the session,
but I really thank all of you for this. To me, this is a history-making day. If it's not for all of you, for my two departments, it is a day of making history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lubisi. I trust you were recording the part about some funds being set aside to study it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Minister. I think you raise vital questions about the inevitability of the post-colony as dystopian, and you raise a very vital point about the adoption of a Washington consensus and what that might have meant for the economy which we didn't build. Um, so to, mo to move on now, thank you very much, sir, for many of your thoughts there. Its excavation was painful, but its methods were salutary and its truths a work of record and of archive about which we can never say, I didn't know, and how did we get there? It's all there for us in the Commission of Inquiry volumes to learn from, to ensure against, and to make good on. Its chairperson, who is here with us today wearing a different hat, never ever missed a session and there were hundreds of sessions. He listened with an intense focus and he thanked every person, sinner or saint, who honored the invitation to come and tell their truths. <laughs> You're lucky you didn't get the invitation, Minister, although I do hear what you wanted to, what you wanted to say there. So very welcome, Chief Justice, and thank you for taking time from the Constitutional Court to be with us today. You are most welcome. Uh, I'm just saying to the minister here and I are not so tall, so. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Program Director, uh, Professor Muller, the Chairperson, uh, Dr. Lubisi, uh, Minister of Science and Innovation, Dr. Blade Nzimande, Justice Goldstone, Justice Griffler, that I'm very happy to see here today. I haven't seen them in a very, very long time. And it's colleagues that I have uh, a very high regard for because they were the first team. I call them the first team, the first uh, justices of our constitutional court who paved the way for, for all of us. So I'm very pleased to, to see them. I see Advocate Bigoli as well. I uh, see quite a number of faces. Of course, Prof Musala. Uh, I think I can tell you, uh, Minister, that uh, he is former Secretary of the Commission. <laughs> um, so he, the Commission's term ended in March, but. Uh, He's uh, very committed. He continues to do whatever needs to be done. So to assist with what uh, needs to be done to make sure that the records of the commission and the whatever loose ends still need to be tied are tied. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to be here this morning. And I thank Professor Muller and her team for inviting me to be part of this very important workshop and to address you on the topic, has the capturing of the state placed our democracy at risk? This workshop is held exactly one year since I submitted the last two parts of the report of the State Capture Commission 
to the president. It was on the evening of 22 June 2022 that I handed parts five and six of the commission's report to the president. When I handed those two parts of the report to the president, some members of my team and I had been working continuously for something like 36 hours without sleeping as we pushed ourselves to finish the report and hand it over to the president. The whole nation was waiting and as some of you might recall, there were some postponements that happened before the report, final report was actually handed over to the president. We were exhausted, we were very tired, but I think I want to take this opportunity as we finish a year since the handover of those last parts of the commission's report. To once again acknowledge the contribution of the whole team in the commission to the work of the commission. The legal team, the investigation team, the secretariat, everybody. But I also want to also take this opportunity as I re reflect on that time to just say, I continue to be very grateful to the people of South Africa who supported the commission, even when it was going through some of its most difficult times. Ordinary South Africans, civic organizations, NGOs, there were many people who sent emails, there were many people who sent messages, even when it was very difficult, and said to us, we stand with you, please continue with the work of the commission. Those who supported us in that way enabled us to continue even when it was very difficult. So I think that uh, it's important that, <coughs> excuse me, when we are one year after the handover of the final report and we look back, I just acknowledge the role that many people played in making sure that we could continue with our work. I therefore think that it is very important that we meet in this fashion a year since the handover of the last two parts of the report, because a year is a reasonable time to reflect on the work of the commission. The topic that I've been asked to address, as I have indicated, is has the capturing of the state placed our democracy at risk? The answer to the question is an unequivocal yes. However, it is necessary to start at the beginning. And the beginning is that when the commission began its hearings, it invited two international experts on state capture to give evidence before it. Those were Professor Kaufman and Hellman and they gave a definition of state capture that included 
that the state captors make illicit payments to government officials in order to get them to change the rules of the game or rules and regulations to advantage them. Indeed, in their article, Seize the State, Seize the Day, they provide the following definition of state capture. State capture is defined as shaping the formation of the basic rules of the game, i.e. laws, rules, decrees, and regulations through illicit and non-transparent private payments to public officials. The commission did not regard this definition as embracing all forms of state capture. In South Africa, those who pursued state capture in SOEs did not seek to have any rules, laws, or regulations changed. The state capture that they pursued, that was pursued by the Guptas and their associates was anchored on the influence and control they had on the head of state, who was also the president of the ruling party, and ensured that he would engineer the removal from strategic positions in SOEs of persons who would not be prepared to cooperate with the Gupta's in wrongdoing. And he would appoint to those strategic positions people who would cooperate with the Gupta's and with those who had influence on him. Notwithstanding the fact that state capture in South Africa, whether by the Gupta's or Busasa, or Bain and Company did not include that any rules or regulations be changed. The Commission found that state capture had happened in this country. The South African version of state capture entailed having great influence or control over government officials, which included the head of state and the use of payments to politicians and corrupt government officials to ensure that existing rules and regulations would be breached for the purpose of advancing their business interests. I do not think that the changing of rules and regulations is an essential requirement of state capture. I cannot see why if A, instead of asking that the rules be changed, uses illicit payments with government officials in order to ensure that existing rules are breached, why that should not be state capture. It seems to me that there are different forms of state capture, but one must recognize the essential elements. The capture of the state does not require that all the three arms of state be captured. If an individual or group of individuals have as strong an influence on the head of state as did the Guptas. And that influence is used not for the head of state to make decisions that are lawful and serve the interests of the people, but that serve the interests of only some individuals or group of individuals or entities that, in my view, is still state capture, notwithstanding the fact that not all three arms of the state are involved. It is important that we 
refresh our memories a little bit about how in particular the Guptas went about the their project of state capture. There is no doubt when one goes through the evidence that was heard by the commission that the Guptas and those who worked with them had planned this project in good time and worked on it for quite some time. You will remember that in 2009, we had a general election and that after the election, President Zuma became the president of the country. But the Guptas had been close to the family for quite a few years before that. But where they started was with Transnet after the departure of Maria Ramos. The evidence might, that the commission had might not be so strong to say that in regard to why President Zuma insisted on Mr. Gama being the CEO of Transnet, that it was the Guptas. But what happened afterwards suggests very strongly that it may have been. Now, that was 2009. So for about two years, President Zuma did not want the position to be filled. That is the position of CEO of Transnet because he wanted Mr. Gama. And this was at a time when Mr. Gama had gone through a very fair disciplinary process chaired by a member of the Johannesburg Bar, an independent person who wrote a very thorough judgment and made findings against him. But nevertheless, Mr. Zuma wanted Mr. Gama to be the CEO of Transnet. For over two years, uh, the vacancy was not filled. On the 7th of December 2010, the Guptas newspaper came out for the first time and it said Mr. Brian Mulefe would be the CEO of Transnet. Within three or four months thereafter, he became group CEO of Transnet, that is Mr. Brian Mulefe. If you move from Transnet at that time and you go to Denel, you will find that they were already working at Denel in 2011. They met with Mr. Riaz Saluji, who was CEO of Denel, and tried to see if he could co cooperate with them, but they were frustrated because he didn't cooperate with them. And it seems that they then left uh, that project or pushed, shelved it because also the board that was there was a board that was very professional and that had done a very good job. And it seems from all the evidence was made up of people of integrity. What they had done in the meantime is that in 2015, they then went to ESCOM. They've been to Transnet, Mr. Brian Mulefe was there, and in the board of Transnet, that certain people that they have put in there, then they moved to ESCOM. And then this, in 2015, the month of March becomes very important in the Utah state capture because a lot of things happened during that month. 
but also the year of 2015 is quite important because later in the year, other events happen which go to the issue of state capture. In March, you have a meeting involving, which was meant to include Mr. Zuma, Mr. Dumieni, and a gentleman called Mr. Linnell at Matlamandrovo, where they were going to discuss the removal of certain officials at ESCOM. That meeting did not ultimately help Mr. Zuma, and the other two continued. Then on the 8th of March, you have a meeting in Mr. Zuma's official residence in Kevin, where the plan for the removal of certain executives at ESCOM is discussed. But that plan was not a plan that was done or made in that meeting. That plan had been made elsewhere, and the real people who were behind it were not in that meeting, except for Mr. Zuma, who spent a certain amount of time there. And then on the 10th of March, you have a board meeting at ESCOM. Now, this board was a board which the Guptas had already made sure included a lot of people who had a relationship with them or their associates. And that board then discusses the removal or suspension of certain executives. Ultimately, they are suspended the following day on the 11th. But the 10th of March is also an important date when we look at how the Guptas went about their state capture project. Because at Melrose Arch on the 10th of March, Mr. Essa met with Mr. Coco from ESCO. And the two of them invited certain officials of ESCO and discussed with them the fact that there were going to be certain suspensions and discuss the issue of who would act in what positions. And that is the 10th of March, 11th of March, the suspensions happen. Within three, four months after that, they are removed completely. They are offered lots of money to, to go away. And in the meantime, Mr. Brian Mulefe is seconded from Transnet to ESCOM. He, whose uh, assumption of the position of CEO of Transnet was foretold by the Gupta newspaper. And then Mr. Anoch Singh takes the position of Chief Financial Officer. And the rest of what happens happened after that, we all know. But they then take exactly that plan. They used it as common, go to Denel. And at Denel, they make sure that Minister Brown, who the commission found had a relationship with the Guptas, which he denied. that she made sure that the people, most of the people who were appointed to the board of the mayor had a relationship with the Guptas. And they took as chairperson an attorney who had been struck off the role for a few years and was readmitted. But when you try and find out how he was readmitted, it becomes a very really, uh, difficult thing because the judgment that relates to his being struck off shows that this was somebody that didn't have integrity. And you would expect that the Minister of Public Enterprises, when they look for 
people who could be appointed as board members would be people, they would be looking for people of integrity. And of course, there too, at the mail, certain officials were suspended, including the CEO and the, the financial officer. So they, they, they always made sure that the CEO must be their person and the chief financial officer must be their person. So they, they did that and they put their people and the rest of what happened is some of what we know. That was how they, they, op they operated. So when the commission then looked at the definition that the international experts had provided, the commission took the view that what happened in South Africa, even though there was no demand or request for the rules to be changed, was state capture. <clears throat> it will be seen that whether one is dealing with the phenomenon of state capture as defined by Professors Elman or Kaufman, or with the South African version of state capture, state capture places our democracy at risk. State capture is about greed, selfishness, and criminality. Where it has happened in South Africa, the head of state was captured and he used his constitutional and legal powers to make decisions that advanced the business interests of the Guptas. During the years which were considered by the Commission, the evidence revealed a number of instances where the head of state at the time made decisions that benefited the Guptas. One will recall the case of Mase Mr. Masego, Temba Masego. One will recall the case of the removal of the certain executives at ESCOM. One will recall in a different context how, as the judgment of the Constitutional Court in Corruption Watch reveals, he did everything to push the National Director of Public Prosecutions at the time, Mr. Nasana, out of that position in circumstances where there was no valid reason for it. Where a president no longer makes decisions that serve the interests of the people, but makes decisions that serve his own interests or his family or his friends, that undermines our democracy. What demonstrates beyond any doubt that state capture places our dem democracy at risk is when one deals with the role of the National Assembly. Section 42.3 of the Constitution provides that the National Assembly is elected to represent the people. So when the National Assembly fails to protect the people against state capture, it fails in this duty. When you represent someone in a forum, you are supposed to protect that person's interests. And if you fail to do that, you have failed in your duty. Apart from providing that the National Assembly is elected to represent the people, and to ensure government by the people under the Constitution, Section 42.3 of the Constitution goes on to provide that the National Assembly does this, that is to represent the people and to ensure government by the people under the Constitution by choosing the president, by providing a national forum for public consideration of issues taken democratically and by making sure that it performs its oversight functions over the executive. The commission in its report detailed various instances during the Gupta state capture 
where parliament, the National Assembly, failed to take steps that would have made sure that the state capture was exposed early and that would have made sure that it was stopped before South Africans lost over 58 billion rand through the Gupta state capture. The reason why it failed is well known. It is because the majority party refused to agree to the establishment of an inquiry to investigate the allegations. There were a number of instances where there was an opportunity for the majority party in parliament to agree, but it did not. And therefore, the group has continued with their project. And the transactions that happened afterwards happened because they were not stopped by parliament when it could have stopped them. I have said before that if another group of people were to do exactly what the group has did to pursue state capture, if another group were to do the same, parliament would still not be able to stop it. That is simply because I've seen nothing that has changed. The question that arises then is, if parliament won't be able to protect the interests of the people, if there are attempts for another state capture, who will protect the people? I can only think of two possible answers. The one is that if certain electoral reforms are made, which allow people to have more power over members of parliament with constituencies, there may be a chance that there would be a, a number of members of parliament who know what the right thing is to do, who would be prepared to say no to their own parties when their parties want them to do something that is against the interests of the people. And they would be able to do so because they would know that even if the party expelled them, as long as the people in their constituency are happy with their performance in parliament, they would be able to go back to parliament after the next elections. Other than that, the other possibility is one that the commission has pointed out in this report, namely, there should be a standing anti-state capture and anti-corruption commission that works the same way as the commission that I was honored to chair, which can call anybody, whether it's the president or any member of parliament or any minister to come and answer questions where there are allegations of corruption and state capture. So that even if the majority in parliament do not want certain questions to be asked or protect ministers and the president from certain questions in that commission, there would be full opportunity for everything to be explored and the evidence given and the answers given 
would be given in the open. So at least there would be nothing that could be swept under the carpet. And the hope is that if you have state capture and through that commission, it is established that there is serious corruption and state capture, there would be a strong public opinion, which might force even a majority in parliament that didn't want to do something to actually do something because of the strong public opinion. The last one is simply that we have to trust the citizens of this country. I believe in active citizenry. I believe that the people of South Africa are the ones who must take their destiny in their own hands. They are the ones who must say, we have had state capture, but it is not going to happen again. They must be the ones who say, never, never and never again. They are the ones who must see which leaders are tolerant of corruption. Because Saka right now doesn't need leaders who are tolerant of corruption. It needs leaders who are prepared to go very far to fight corruption. So my belief is that when everything else fails, it is you, the people, that give me hope. It is you, the people, that I believe will make sure that this country is turned around. Thank you. Sure, CJ, you leave us with many, many challenges for the day ahead. It is you, the people, who must ensure that this does not happen again. I've seen nothing that has changed, and that's in relation to Parliament. March the 15th, 2015, have we learned its lessons. Thank you very much for an excellent keynote address, which sets a perfect foundation for the rest of the day. Before you take your leave of us, there's a special message for you, uh, Chief Justice, and it comes from someone, someone who's become a bit of a rock star. So George Clooney and Amal Clooney set up a foundation, and they decide that they're going to host an annual set of Global Human Rights Awards. And what do they call them? The Albies. So Albie Sachs um, has a message for you, Chief Justice Sondo. Thank you very much. I so wish I could have been in the hall with you all. I, I so wish I could have heard the Chief Justice speaking and felt part of what really is an extremely important occasion, uh, which should be a springboard to, to the follow-up. We, we, we've had the Zondo Commission. We've lived it now with it for some years. And I just wish to underline how significant it is already, independently of what follows, how in a way it has already transformed the landscape in South Africa. It's had an enormous impact already on what you might call the South African culture, what people are saying and demanding and thinking, how government behaves, how people on the ground feel. And, and let me start with what for me is a huge, huge positive, and that is the resilience of our constitutional institutions. Uh, there's a kind of word went around at one stage that when the constitution was made, the people all thought that only angels would go to Parliament and get into government. Not true at all. I, I remember when I was asked to give 
a lecture as Honorary Professor at the University of Cape Town in 1991, saying that constitutions are based on the tension between perfectibility and corruptibility. Perfectibility we aim for the highest, corruptibility we aim against the hardships we'd seen, the dangers that had happened in countries where people had fought heroically for freedom and gone on afterwards to abuse their positions of power. We'd seen problems in our own ranks. So we wanted a constitution for the people. We built in lots and lots of safeguards. And look at how some of these safeguards have worked in the present case. The public protector. Uh, I played a small role in the creation of the position of the public protector of I been bombed in 1988 and I'm looking, what can I do to prepare for a new constitution in South Africa? Go to Norway. That's a democratic country with open society uh, and strong community, social justice, part and parcel of the culture of the country. I discovered the constitution meant almost nothing. Uh, everything depended on the values of the country and constitutionalism, the principle of constitution were everything. The constitution as a document didn't matter, but I came across the ombudsman and said, that's what we need in South Africa. I brought it back and I found an immense support for the idea. We didn't like the term ombudsman, but we came up with the term public protector. At that stage, just to be a kind of a busy body that you could report to, to keep government on its toes. And when the final text of the Constitution was created, by the Constitutional Assembly representing the whole nation in Parliament, 1994 to 1996, they strengthened the powers of the public protector. So it wouldn't just be making recommendations, but recommendations binding on Parliament. And lo and behold, Tuli Maroncela uses those powers and uses those powers to command the president to create a commission of inquiry to inquire into his misdeeds. Everybody knew he was the person mentioned in the report facing the most criticism of any particular political figure and insisting that it be the chief justice who appoints the person to inquire into the alleged misdemeanors. And then the nation hears the name of Raymond Zondo hadn't been very, very prominent until then. Deputy Chief Justice, one of the team of 11 up on Constitution Hill. And we see and hear Raymond Zondo, uh, an unlikely hero, not somebody who goes around smiting enemies, making speeches, projecting himself. Warm, Collected, focused, happens to have a very lovely, rich, baritone voice that, that makes listening to him a pleasure, not something that all uh, members of the judiciary have. But above all, imbued with the spirit of the Constitution and focusing on the task at hand. And the, the second feature that, that kicks in that I think is a great positive is the longing of the nation to hear the truth is reflected in government, not trying to crimp the constitution, but increasing its time span massively, increasing its budget massively. And the president himself going into the witness box for two whole days. I don't know of a single other country where that has happened, where the president has agreed to testify for two days to a commission that asks him probing questions, not sweetheart questions, over two days. So these are all lasting positives for South Africa. The constitution in that sense is functioning and is seen to be functioning. And finally, the report itself. It's a massive report, quite physically massive, uh, high, heavy to carry. People joked at the time of, of the actual release of the report. It's not even the detail that in the report that matters. It's the fact that we South Africans had the capacity, the intensity, the organization, the funding and the personnel to look deep into ourselves, to look deep into our failures. And with the person of Raymond Zondo at the head, we've got the story. We've got many, many stories. No one can deny that awful things happened 
in our government, at very high reaches of government, in recent memory here in South Africa. And that to me is a huge achievement. The next phase, the next phase would be people are longing to see the scoundrels being held to account, crooks going to jail. Lots of money has been recovered, the huge expenditures on this massive uh, massive hearings that were held and so on. From the crooks and many cases, this internationally well-known high and mighty accounting companies and other uh, financial service agencies uh, conniving at and contributing, supporting to these terrible things that happened. So now it's over to the next phase. Let justice be done. Let the recommendations of the Zondo Commission be fulfilled as much as possible. Let us aim for 100% success. But already we've achieved, I would say, 60-70% success. We've got the truth to come out. We've got to change the culture of South Africa. What was looking like becoming the South African way now can be condemned as a South African practice that's been unearthed, exposed, denounced by Raymond Zondo. Thank you, Raymond Zondo. Once upon a time, I was a judge sitting up and reading your judgments from the Labour Appeal Court. Now I'm just called defunct functus, a former judge, but taking enormous pride in yourself, in your role as Chief Justice, in your colleagues on the Constitutional Court, and in the Constitution that we created to be a bastion for, for the liberty we've been fighting for, for the hopes that we want, and also a mechanism for dealing with the crooks and scoundrels in our society. Uh, Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, on behalf of the HSRC and the organizing committee, I want to thank you for your commitment to exposing state capture and corruption, for your patience and perseverance in bringing the commission to a weighty conclusion, yes, in both senses of the word, and for gracing us with your presence today and delivering a sobering and inspirational address that contextualizes state capture so beautifully. I think we can say without fear of contradiction that you, sir, are a national treasure. <clears throat> and now I'd like to invite my colleague, uh, Dr. Tobe Kazondi, from the Developmental Capable and Ethical State Research Division at the HSRC to present you with uh, a small gift to remind you of this significant moment in our nation's trajectory. So would you come forward, please? <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. I've always wanted to say this, so all rise as the Chief Justice and the Minister leave, and then we all go to tea thereafter. If we could stand for the Chief Justice to leave. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
We've seen significant institutional strengthening after the Commission of Inquiry into state capture, and as we've entered a phase of less intensity of grand corruption than there was before. So very painfully, SARS has clearly been reformed, as I'm sure we all feel from all those calls. <laughs> I've just completed reading the latest annual report of the National Prosecuting Authority, and it's quite clear to me that there is real reform happening there. But obviously, and this may be a bias, the cherry on the top of our crown is the Special Investigating Unit and, of course, the Auditor General's Office. And to tell us more today is the Deputy Auditor General, Mr. Vonani Chauke. Thank you, welcome, and thank you for your patience. We're running a bit late. Thank you, Program Director. Unlike the Chief Justice, I won't try to adjust the mic, but I'm short as well. <laughs> so it seems like when we are arranging the program today, they check our height. Um, I'd like to greet everyone here, especially the former Chief Justices. Uh, my dad realized that I will never be a Chief Justice in my life, so he gave me justice in my name. <laughs> so in, during the elections of 1994, uh, when you were chairing the Electoral Commission, People used to call me by your surname, so I really appreciate it. Um, we're given a quick task just to say, what is our reflection as the Auditor General? And on behalf of AG Tsaganamalek, who unfortunately could not be here today, I would like to share with you our, our reflection on what has happened. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting the Chief Justice two weeks ago. That meeting was limited to the leaders in the audit profession. And you will notice that in the recommendation of the Chief Justice report on Para 34, he specifically indicated that the Office of the Auditor General should be capacitated to audit all public entities. Um, I cannot underline or bold all when I mention it. If it was in a state, if it was a presentation, I would indicate that. But it's impractical for us to audit everything. We do appreciate the vote of confidence from the Commission to to the audit profession and specifically to the AGSA as an office. However, if AG Sakanamalek was here, she will share with you all the importance of the accountability ecosystem. The foundation of that accountability ecosystem is active citizenry. And I'd like to remind you of some of the comments that the Chief Justice said earlier. So our model of what will prevent the corruption, the rot, and the state capture from occurring again will not be placed on other people, but us as citizens. And right now, I'm not talking to you as a DAG, but I'm talking to you as a South African citizen. It is our responsibility to ensure that if we want to leave this country in a good hand, we want to leave this country in a better shape than, than we found it to be, we have to act our role as citizens. Sometimes as professional, we hide behind the professional responsibilities and do not take our role as citizens actively. So whatever we may have and whatever hat that we might be wearing today, I do think that there is one hat that is very critical. We have the mindset, we have the capability to be able to lead by example in being that active citizens. And this talk to us to being, um, being visible in our communities to be able to do what needs to be done. So in the ecosystem, there are various layers that we have put in there. And I would like to talk about and emphasize some of the things that allow the state capture to happen, but focus more on the future. And I hope that the deliberations today, you will build on that in terms of how do we strengthen those other lines of defense? So while the commission said that we should rely on audit, and it is a valuable tool, but the fact is auditors come after the fact. You have seen in the recent past when there was COVID, the office of the, of the AG was called upon to audit, and we could see the value of auditing real time. But practically in a everyday situation, we cannot do that. We only come after the fact. So it is important that we have the other lines of defense being effective. When the president declared a state of disaster in KZN and Eastern Cape last year, he emphasized that the office will be called upon to come and audit. And while we appreciate that extra mandate that has been given to the office, we want to emphasize that let's get the other lines to work. 
when the Chief Justice was speaking earlier on, he gave specific dates and specific appointments that will say a person who has been given the responsibility to appoint someone who has got questionable ethics should not appoint that person. He explained how the accountability ecosystem was weakened, especially at the board level. So we need to strengthen our boards, which means how do we address that? I hope you're going to be able to answer those questions. This whole system was based on people of integrity making the right decisions on behalf of the state or the state-owned companies. The way that the Chief Justice explained this whole thing and it makes it so practical, you could see that the boards were weakened. So boards that are supposed to hold the, the executive to account were no longer working. In the examples that he gave, he indicated that the executive, the CEO and the CFOs were the one who were, the good ones were removed. But good thing that we need to know as part of these things that there were some good examples of people who stood their ground. He mentioned in detail without mentioning the name, the ESCOM example. There were certain, there were certain executives who stood their ground. So what do we do with those executives who stand their ground? We need to create an environment where instead of waiting for the audit, whistleblowers who pick up some of these things are protected. We have seen an environment where people see things on the ground, they know that things are not going right, and some have got the ethical posture to be able to, to cite those issues. But do we protect them? Do we have an environment that protects these people? I like the final recommendation where he recommended that we might need a body that is a standing body that helps you to report these things that happen and they can call anyone, which I think it's a great idea. But the reality is that body will be burdened with so many cases if we don't act our part in all the various layers. So our view as the, as the Office of the Auditor General is that some of the things that needs to be strengthened is placing people who have got the right integrity in governance structures. And that should be simple. We should be able to vet these people and place the people that have got integrity. We know each other. And in those cases, there were certain board members when you look in some of these state-owned entities that were there. Their voice were not heard. Those of you who remember the state captures interview, there were instances of good people who resigned from this board. Instead of us protecting them and listening to them, we allow them to resign. Sometimes some of these people don't have the means to resign because that is their, li that is their livelihood. So it's important for us as a country to say, how do we deal with those areas and don't allow things to continue? There was questionable ethical issues that were raised. And in some cases, if you follow the storyline that is gave today, which was a simplified version of how certain executives were moved around, their appointment were predicted, and there might have been a clear game plan. As citizens, we need to have a clear game plan to say, how do we elevate these messages to ensure that when we see these things going wrong, we do deal with that. In terms of the, the way forward and some of our thinking is that it might be Practical, and this was tried somewhere else, right? So there was a deployment committee uh, somewhere. We're thinking an appointment committee can do a good job, but sometimes a committee is a committee. It depends on the integrity of the individuals who are on that committee. So while our original, com our original um, suggestion was to say, we might have to have a committee that vet and oversees the appointment of these individuals that comes into these bodies to ensure that people who are appointed have got the best interest of them, the best interest of the entities that they are employed in. A critical part of addressing some of the issues that are happening in the state capture and also in the state from the work that we do as the AGSA is professionalization of the public sector. As an office, we are committed to share our expertise in terms of the trainees that we have trained being able to be absorbed by the public sector. When you go to most of the entities, we have just recently released our general report on the local government. You will find that chief financial officers who are appointed there do not have the necessary qualification. Without the necessary affiliation to professional bodies, then people don't have the right ethical posture in those places. If they were to lose that job, getting a similar job somewhere else becomes very difficult. So those individuals, it's become very easy for them to be corruptible. 
But if we were to professionalize the public service, it will go a long way. The oversight bodies, when you look into how our democracy was uh, designed, the checks and balances are there. It's just that the effectiveness of the oversight bodies is not always in place. I've, been, I've spoken a bit about the boards. Um, when you look into the Transnet case study, it's very clear in terms of how certain executive roles were moved to committees that were dealing with uh, tenders and the commission really dealt, to, uh, dealt with those uh, instances at length. Our political system is an area that the Chief Justice has spoken to and he spoke about reforms uh, in that area. Uh, program director, I am aware that we are running out of time and I will not spend too much time, but I'd like to just emphasize that the accountability framework that we've got as AGSA is something that we would like to emphasize that we check it out and hopefully we will all be able to play our role. In that particular um, ecosystem, we speak about, like I've mentioned, an active citizenry, but there are various layers that need to happen. So why would a portfolio committee that's supposed to hold a minister accountable not do their way. Why would cabinet in totality not want to do their work? We are having active engagement with the various people to ensure that we give them the right insight. As AGSA, we've been doing a lot of work in the past and people used to ignore our reports. I'm glad to confirm that parliament has amended our, um, our act, which, uh, which is our foundation. And last time I met with the Chief Justice, which was two weeks ago, he emphasized that we need to start using those teeth. We do have new powers that are part of what we call um, material irregularities, which means if we see something that has been done, it's been done wrong, and uh, assets were lost, we are able to give specific findings. And if the accounting officer does not act upon those ones, we can take the process up until a stage where we can issue a certificate of, of debt meaning at a personal capacity that accounting officer have to pay. I know that there's a lot of impatience in the system in terms of saying, when are you gonna issue the first COD? Our posture is, when the need comes, we'll issue that COD. However, I need to make everyone aware that if we issue a COD, it means that the ecosystem has failed. Ideally, when we raise a problem, people who are responsible to deal with it should address it. So while we might want to issue the COD in those cases where people are not acting on our findings, our hope is that when you issue that MI, people will realize the mistakes that mistakes done and they'll correct it. And I'm glad to confirm that over the past few years, we have seen progress where money that was lost to the state is being returned. There are potential losses that could have continued um, into an area where in the past we used to report a lot of billions, but we are seeing the fundamental changes in people addressing not just that particular transaction, but the foundation by addressing the internal control environment. And that is our wish that as part of our new strategy within AGSA, which is focusing on culture shift 2030, where we want to change the culture of public sector. People should not go to public sector to see it as a piggy bank, but people should go to public sector to go and serve. And we should do that with pride. And I do hope that the deliberations that you're gonna to have today will go a long way. I'm glad that the minister, of, um, the minister has committed that there will be a fund where some of this work will continue. While as an AGSA, we might have a particular view, we are gonna appreciate some of the views that you're gonna bring through in terms of how do we strengthen the other lines of defense. We cannot be the last line of defense as auditors. Uh, and I will appreciate the outcome of this. I do have my colleague here, Payne, who's gonna be joining you for the whole day, but unfortunately there were some few uh, commitments that I've got on my side. So I will be coming in and out of the engagement, but I'm looking forward to a very fruitful in engagement. Program Director, I would like to thank you for the time that you've given us to share our reflection as the Office of the Auditor General. Thank you.
Um, it's a fantastic office. The, the latest municipal and provincial uh, report show that using the amendments, thank you very much, sir, to, to has saved us 470 million rand. That's just in the past year. It's not great given the scale of what we sit with, but that amendment to the Public Audit Act is really beginning um, to do its work, and that's great. So in 2019, who can tell me what the Pan Essays Language Board's word of the year was? the Zondo Commission, <laughs> um, or sometimes just the Zondo. It had entered the public consciousness in such a way that it was made word of the year. And I'm sure you'll agree with me when I acknowledge that probably most of you were sitting on the edge of your seats watching Miss Norma and Goma, uh, then Gigaba's testimony for those days, as well as a lot else. Um, to, tell us, um, to tell us about how society feels, understands, and perceptions of the Commission of Inquiry, we're joined by our two colleagues. Dr. Dr. Ben Roberts and Mr. Kapeli Mkunu of the HSRC, who look at the South African Social Attitude Survey and specifically perceptions of the Commission of Inquiry. Very welcome. I certainly don't think I have a problem with height today. So. <laughs> Um, thank you for the opportunity to present these, this first presentation of findings from the range of surveys we've undertaken as the HSRC into issues of state capture and the Zondor Commission. In recent years, we've seen through the surveying that we do, really mounting attention and concern about corruption coming through from the public. Indeed, the share of South Africans that listed corruption is one of the most important problems that require addressing increased threefold over the last two decades from 10 percent mentioning it in 2003 to 36 percent mentioning it in late 2021 and that's the graph on the top right this is uh, being seen to impact both on the perceptions of the quality as well as the performance of democracy in the country it also is increasingly being shown to have a bearing on political legitimacy and, and indeed behavior. And one of the expressions of that is seeing changing electoral norms uh, through each successive electoral cycle. We heard uh, from the Chief Justice issues about the centrality of public perceptions, indeed strong public perceptions. And this is crucial for determining public awareness and understanding, for measuring public confidence and trust, for identifying perceived impact and effectiveness of, of uh, key institutions such as the Commission, as well as it's crucial for policy interventions. So the aim of this particular part of um, this research that we're doing at the HSRC, there's a broader Future of Democracy project, which, in, um, which is quite wide ranging but the, the public opinion forms one cent, com, central component of that, is to gain a conceptually grounded understanding of attitudes towards corruption, state capture, and indeed the commission. To date, we've conducted four surveys, um, which uh, have been undertaken by the Human Sciences Research Council, covering a period from late 2021 through to a current round of surveying, which is uh, nearly complete, um, which should be finished in the next couple of weeks. Really, and what we've done is combine these, uh, it's a combination of nationally representative surveying through the HSRC's research infrastructure, the South African Social Attitude Survey, as well as certain online surveys to go a little deeper into um, certain aspects of the attitudes. In terms of the social attitude survey series, it's nationally representative of those 16 years and older living in private residence throughout the country. Individuals are selected each year through random probability methods. Uh, in, 20, we, in 2021, we successfully surveyed just, shy, just over 2,800 respondents and just over 3,100 in 2022. The data is then benchmarked to Statsasay's mid-year population estimates and the means of interviewing is by face-to-face -face interviewing. The two online surveys that we conducted were non-probability convenience sampling 
the same questions were fielded as in the nationally representative surveys, but we had more open-ended questions to really probe the motivations, the reasons the public is favorable or more critical of issues relating to the performance of the commission and its activities. So the first one of survey of that, uh, in that in, of the online surveying happened in late in December 21, and just, uh, about just shy of 9,000 9, responses. And the current surveying that we're doing now, we've had just over 3,000. The expectation is to get to, to around 5,000 in the next couple of weeks. Both surveys adhere to strict ethical and quality control protocols. In terms of the conceptualization of the survey, we really wanted to adopt a strong concept, have a, a really strong conceptualization. And it draws really on an established tradition around procedural, um, procedural justice. There's a strong application of this kind of model to um, the, the police, the courts internationally. And we thought that it would be suitable for application to the, indeed the, the Zondel Commission. At its heart is issues around trust. Trust in the commission in terms of issues around perceived effectiveness, trust in distributive fairness, as well as trust in procedural fairness of the commission. Those sentiments would be interlinked with the perceived legitimacy of the commission. Aspects such as moral alignment, uh, issues such as the duty to respect the decisions and recommendations made by, by the commission. And those are seen to or theoretically are expected to have an instrumental bearing on what matters most, overall confidence in the Commission. Also on the far left-hand side, you can see the yellow and grey boxes. Those are factors that might shape the, those core elements we're interested in. And that includes obviously levels of knowledge and awareness, both of state capture and the Commission's activities. It include issues such as perceived scale of political corruption. It would also include things such as the perceived impact on society of state capture, and also views around key events and episodes that occurred during the, the Zondo proceedings. And lastly, jumping right to the far right is the confidence the public vests in the, in, in the commission is obviously interlinked, we, we theoretically expect, to commission outcomes such as views on prosecution, views about the effect that the Zondo findings will have on corruption society from a normative point of view and also the kind of actions that are likely to be taken against corrupt individuals. So what we're gonna show is a headline findings from this model. Uh, my colleague Napelli is going to walk through um, the knowledge and awareness cluster through to the trust and legitimacy cluster. And then I'll return to talk about the final confidence and the post on the um, assessments that are coming through now. So I'm gonna hand over to my colleague Napelli to just walk you through some of those findings. Um, good day. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. Um, the session in the morning was lovely, um, but now we are about to do some number crunching. We are in the CSIR after all. So um, as Dr. Roberts has alluded, um, the first part that I'd like to take you through relates to perceptions and experiences, um, particularly when it comes to corruption. These we figured were quite important because we wanted to get um, a sense of what the public felt regarding um, the matters of corruption, whether it's exposure or experience. Uh, we found that 62% of our respondents, just under two thirds, had indicated that they believe that almost all politicians are involved in some form of corruption. Um, and only 4% had indicated that um, almost none were involved. We then looked at um, self-reported exposure to corruption and we found that slightly under half at 49% um, of our surveyed participants indicated that um, they had requested um, um, a favor or bribe from a government official in exchange for a service, a service which would obviously be rendered um, free of charge. We then looked at uh, cadet deployment um, as well. And for cadet deployment, we found that about 28% of our surveyed participants had indicated that um, cadet deployment increased corruption. Um, while less 12% indicated that it had decreased corruption and 19% indicating that it had no effect at all. We then sought to try and get a better understanding of what the 
broader public understands um, conceptually on the terms of uh, state capture. Given that um, since pretty much the 14th of October 2016, when um, Professor Tulima Tonzela released the report, it has become part of the public discourse. So in getting a better understanding of our self-rated knowledge of um, state capture, we found that about a third of our survey participants had indicated that they had um, moderate to high levels of knowledge um, when it came to um, the concept of state capture. Um, about 40% indicating that um, they did not have knowledge of uh, state capture as a concept. After assessing um, the conceptual understanding of self-reported knowledge, we then sought to get a better understanding of the perceived impact again, from a public um, opinion standpoint. Um, here we found that um, perceived impact of state capture on particularly state-owned entities was quite high, um, slightly, less than, slightly less than 50% or 47% of our participants reported that it had um, great impact or large impact on um, state-owned entities such as ESCOM. It also had a profound um, impact on the economy. For example, in 2022, this figure stood at 45%, up 5% um, in the previous year. And of course, uh, with service delivery as well, 37% um, in 22 and 30% uh, in 2021, a 7% increase. So we saw uh, a greater recognition of the impact or perceived impact of state capture. After that, we then sought to get a better understanding of the perceived persecutorial responses um, based on whether or not respondents felt enough was being done to prosecute those involved in um, going in state capture. So in our analysis, we found that about two fifths of our participants um, felt that not enough was being done to prosecute those who were involved in state capture. However, slightly over a quarter, about 27% felt that enough was being done. We also saw um, an increase in those who believed not enough was being done by nearly 10% at about um, nine percentage points. So we first spoke about state capture conceptually, we then um, move on to the next step, which is um, awareness of the Zonda Commission, where we sought to understand what do the public know about the Zonda Commission. Here we found that about a third of our um, um, respondents said that they knew um, uh, how the Zonda Commission works and they knew enough about it to um, explain it to um, someone else. Uh, those figures stood at about 34%, um, while as about 40% um, said they did not have um, enough knowledge to explain it. Um, to others. And here we found that there was a bit of a correlation between awareness of state capture conceptually and the Zonda Commission subsequently. Uh, we then moved to perceived um, effectiveness and fairness of the Commission. We did this in, in three ways. Firstly, we looked at the gathering of evidence um, on, on, on corruption, where we asked our broad uh, participants how successful or unsuccessful do you think the Zonda Commission had been in gathering evidence on corruption? And here we found, for example, that those who believe um, that the commission had done well, for example, in 2021, um, was quite close to those who believe that the commission had not done well, so 18 and 19 percent. However, when we move on to the, uh, the following year of 2022, we found that the gap between those who believe that the, co the commission had not done well in correct collecting evidence on corruption had um, increased slightly from 19 to 25 percent. Um, that's widening the gap between those who believe that the commission had been successful and those who believe that the commission had been unsuccessful. We also found that this was a crucial determinant on overall evaluations of the commission and its performance. The second uh, measure we looked at relates to the frequency of um, mistakes. So we asked our participants whether they felt that the commission um, made mistakes. Similar to um, the first measure, we found that there were similarities in those who believe that the commission made mistakes and to those who believe that the commission did not uh, make mistakes. In 2021, the, uh, those figures stood at 19 and 20% respectively. Um, while it's in 2022, so that's 22% and 18% respectively. Again, um, we're not seeing much of a difference between those who believe that the commission um, uh, made mistakes and those who believe that the commission didn't. Um, in our analysis, we also found that this particular issue was um, a moderately important um, driver of overall evaluations of the commission. We then, of course, um, sought to get a public opinion perspective on views regarding time. Um, we asked our respondents whether or not they agree that the commission um, took a long time or took too long to complete all its activities. 
In our analysis, we found that the public was indeed likely or more likely to say that the commission took long. Um, for example, in 2021, this figure stood at 26% compared to 34% um, in 2022. However, whilst there were sentiments regarding the uh, commission taking a long time to complete its work, the, uh, these evaluations did not have any or were not a good predictor of um, the overall evaluation of the, perform, uh, the commission's performance. Meaning that if one um, had views regarding the commission taking too long, it did not necessarily translate to them in negatively evaluating the commission's performance. We then moved on to um, impartiality and decision making with regards to fairness of the commission. Uh, here again, we used uh, we relied on three measures that we had developed. First, related to the fair and impartial decision making processes, where we asked uh, where we asked our respondents how often do you think the commission made fair and impartial decisions based on the uh, evidence presented to it. So here we found that particularly uh, there was not much of a difference as well between those who believe that the commission was always fair and those who believe that the commission was not always fair. Those figures in 2021 stood at 18 and 19 percent respectively, while it just stood at um, 17 and 23 percent in um, 2022. So while some of the positive evaluations uh, were mostly seen in the province of Gauteng and the most negative in Limpopo. We then looked at distributive fairness whereby we asked our participants whether or not they felt that the commission was protecting the interests of the rich and powerful above those of um, ordinary people, given that this is a common um, criticism against the criminal justice system in general. And in our, in our analysis, we found that the public was indeed um, far more likely to provide a negative evaluation um, of, of the commission protecting the interests of um, the, the powerful over those of the ordinary. This figure stood at about 21% in, in 2021, um, compared to 11% of those who believe that or who disagreed with those sentiments. One of the things to note with, with this particular measure is that there was a, ten, a slightly um, a big increase of almost 10% of those who believe that the, the commission was protecting the interests of the powerful between 2021 and 2022. This ultimately um, also was a powerful determinant of whether or not um, the commission um, performed well um, overall. Oh, oh yes, thank you. Um, we then looked at the perceived legitimacy of um, the commission. In getting an understanding of the legitimacy of the commission, we looked at firstly moral alignment, whether or not citizens in general shared the same moral views as the commission. The first question we asked is whether or not um, the commission had the same sense of wrong and right as I do. Um, and we found that almost a third of our participants um, agreed with those sentiments, um, who said that generally they believe that the commission had the same sense of, of wrong and right as they did. What is, what is noteworthy with this particular finding is that the, the number of those who believe that they shared the same um, moral al alignment with the commission was more than double with those who did not share um, the same uh, moral alignment with the commission. The picture remained stable throughout 2021 and 22, um, whilst we saw slightly positive um, increase in, 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 in the sentiments. Second to moral alignment, we looked at whether or not, um, from a value standpoint, the commission um, stood up for values that are important to people like me, again, from a public opinion standpoint. Um, we found that nearly a third of about 30% of our participants um, shared um, moral values of the commission. Um, this was quite higher than those who believed that the commission did not um, share those values. And again, similar to the um, first measure, the picture was fairly consistent um, between 2021 and 2022. We then looked at um, duty and obligation. We asked our respondents whether or not everyone uh, had a duty um, and, and, and um, moral commitment to support the recommendations and follow the recommendations that have been made by the commission. So of those who had um, highlighted or cited high knowledge of the commission, 32% felt that there was a strong um, sense of duty um, to, the, to, to the commission, meaning that there is um, a strong demand for the commission's um, findings and recommendations um, to be followed. And with that, I'd like to hand over back to my co-pilot, Dr. Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are aware it's a barrage of numbers, so um, we apologize for those who are not numerically inclined. Um, 
So to bring it all together, you know, Peli's talked quite a lot about trust and, and issues of effectiveness and fairness that underlie that. He's talked quite a lot also about um, issues of legitimacy, the moral alignment, the sense of shared values. And we want to pull that all together now in, in, into this overarching perspective about how does the pu public uh, rate the, com the job done by the commission at the end of the day. What we see of those that were aware of the commission, um, we saw that in 20, that on average across the two uh, years of surveying, just over a quarter expressed satisfaction with the performance of the commission. So in others, they said they did a good or very good job. 19% expressed discontent, while 54% were neutral and certain. I think just the one thing to touch on relative to what was said earlier, is this big share that are neutral and uncertain. That's very strongly informed by levels of uh, knowledge and awareness. So for instance, if we look at those that have, are able to adequately describe to a third party what the commission was all about, we see that the share that said the commission did a good job jumps up to 44%. Um, and much lower levels of uncertainty. For those who have low knowledge, that drops from 44 down to 30, and very large shares, you know, in the, just over 50%, say neutral or uncertain. So just bear that in the back of your minds and seeing all these figures and that large um, set of neutral and uncertain responses. It's a, it's a reflection of that. Um, we, the satisfaction with the, um, with the Commission's performance from what we've found seems to be clearly associated with the effectiveness in tackling crime and corruption and broad discontent is associated with concerns about uh, perceptions around the waste of uh, financial resources around concerns about bias as well in delays and resolving cases we did ask um, the public an open-ended question explain why you're saying good or bad job um, those of all be those open-ended responses, which are written in the respondents' own own words, were coded and analysed. So this is uh, what has come out of it. If you look at the first column, the good job responses, the top four that are shaded in green were the dominant uh, reasons they gave for that good job assessment. So we heard earlier the issues about exposing corruption ex and, and exposing the truth of what happened. That was the dominant response, so the link to the quality of the evidence generated. Secondly, was issues around uh, the sense that the commission was impartial and held the were trying to hold the guilty accountable. Others were just generally effusive. They were very positive and gave no real further explanation. They just said, really, the performance of the commission is laudable. And then a small share said that the guilty are being held accountable for arrested. About 10% mentioned that. Jump to the far right hand side, the bad job. The dominant response there was the converse. The guilty are not being held accountable or arrested. So that's something that will come out, um, quite, comes out quite strongly, the issue about this appetite for swifter justice to occur. Um, secondly, this concern that there was bias or unfairness um, in the proceedings of, of, of the commission. And then some are concerned about waste of money uh, and, and time. And part of that's linked again to the dominant response around um, the pace of prosecution. And it's leading to a qu fundamental questioning about whether the spend was worth it. So this is just an example or two of the kind of open-ended responses that we get. This one uh, about um, the, the reasons for positive evaluations. I'm not going to read through them apart just one or two. Um, the commission impact all what is hidden by theft and that it will assist uh, the criminal justice department to sentence the wrongdoers. I believe that the Zondo Commission has extracted the truth about state capture and massive corruption. And similarly on the negative side, um, the commission made the investigations out for a favor even when the public didn't support. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. The commission has done a bad job because no one will be prosecuted and that's a waste of taxpayers' money. Arresting the people involved is taking too long, even though they know who they are. Taxpayers were looted and nobody was arrested for doing corruption in the government. And there are thousands more of these types of responses that we coded. This is almost summarizing that big conceptual diagram that we put up uh, at the beginning. And it's broken down to color-shaded blocks. So I'll just summarize it quickly. 
What would the main determinants of confidence in the commission? The social demographic characteristics of the respondents actually were not that significant, apart from a slightly weak gender effect. We didn't find much salient in that data. Corruption perceptions, however, really did were instrumental. Those that uh, get, uh, we found that good job ratings declined as the perceived corruption uh, uh, went up. So there's a clear inverse relationship there. On the knowledge and awareness, um, both knowledge of state capture and the Zondo Commission, um, those measures positively and significantly influenced the good job rating. So the higher awareness produces a more favorable view. Perceived impact, this was one of the confounding ones for us. All those different impacts that Napelli showed the public uh, recognizing, none of those actually had a direct effect on the good bad job evaluations, but we think it might have an indirect uh, effect through the attitudes pe uh, people hold based on those, those uh, particular views on the scale of impact on society. And the perceived response to state capture, and this is a recurring finding as well, good jobs ratings were higher if you believe the authorities are doing enough to prosecute those involved. So there's a, a clear connection between a retrospective evaluation of the commission and what it's done and what's happening in the prosecutorial space. In terms of the trust in the commission, um, effectiveness ratings mattered, procedural fairness evaluations mattered, and the distributive fairness uh, ratings. So the trust cluster is very strong. So too is the legitimacy. So those that had a sense of shared moral alignment on both the moral alignment and the felt duty to obey the recommendations and decisions of the commission, those were equally um, powerful predictors of overall confidence in the commission and, and its work. So now we move into the post sondo space, and we have just a few slides on that, not too much. So the first one is expectation of outcomes in terms of prosecution. So we've touched on a couple of measures, but here's one that we asked. The evidence presented at the Zondo Commission will result or is resulting in the arrest of corrupt individuals. So that, again, those that are aware of the commission, a third agreed with that. Um, and we can see that a fairly small share, small, a relatively smaller share were, were quite critical. I think it's important to say that there's a lot of hope and expectation placed now in prosecution. It's what the, as was said earlier, it's what is now most desired. And I think uh, that the public is, you know, if there, there is the sense that this is not happening, then uh, there will be a re retrospective negative effect on the commission and what, and what it's achieved. Second one is about likelihood of the commission and what it's exposed having a normative effect in terms of reducing corruption. Around 28% of the adult public agreed that this will lead to reduce corruption while 25% disagreed. So again, quite a bit of ambivalence coming through. Um, if you felt the commission did a good job, you're much more likely to say that um, it will lead to a reduced corruption. If you felt the commission didn't do so well, you think you're quite skeptical about the outcome in this regard. Also the quality of evidence. If you feel that the evidence, it did really well in gathering evidence, you'll again feel that there's likely that corruption, uh, the, the fight against corruption will be won. So the overall issue about, was it value for money or waste of resources? Um, a fifth disagreed with the commission, that the commission was a waste of resources in both years around that mark. However, a third agreed that the commission was a waste of funds. But again, what's underlying that, those uh, red and green um, components on the bar chart is that good or bad job again. So that's really shaping the, the calculus. Trust in the effectiveness and fairness of the commission and the legitimacy. So all those items are coming through in in assessing whether it provided value or was wasteful. Again, that's why the prosecution and, and, and now the, the moving through and, and arresting and prosecuting and clay, clawing back the money where possible is, is going to matter because it's part of that overall assessment of whether it provided value. Did the evidence translate into action? Now we talk about the, the implementation of, of, of findings, of the recommendations. 
when we've, um, we've done two bits of surveying on this. One, we've put the, the President Ramaphosa into the mix and that said, will there be political will? Will, he will, the, will the final decisions be implemented? Um, slightly more optimistic in character, the findings, uh, with 32% optimistic, 19% skeptical. We, the online survey we're doing now, we took away the reference to the president and just said, uh, asked uh, people to um, say whether they agreed or disagreed that the final recommendations of the commission will be successfully implemented. So the public was quite split on that. At present, with slightly higher levels of skepticism coming through. The positive responses, and we asked them why you're giving positive or negative responses, so it was another open-ended question, were linked to a sense of political will, trust in political processes, as well as a general sense of hope about prosecution. On the negative side, those who are a bit concerned about whether we'll see traction around the recommendations, there's fear of continued corruption in society, a lack of accountability for the guilty, empty promises, and lack of political will. We thought uh, we also tested views on several issues that came out, both through the recommendations and gen generally through um, the practice and, and experiences of what happened during the Commission proceedings. One is obviously around whistleblowing and, and protection for whistleblowers. What we found is that 71% of adults had heard of whistleblowing, uh, that indicated that it was very or somewhat important for whistleblowers to be protected. However, 46% of South Africans that had heard of whistleblowing indicated that whistleblowers received no protection or only minimal protection. So there's a real gap between the importance ratings and the lived experience of protection. The online survey we're doing now um, asked about levels of support or opposition for the Zondo Commission recommendation about greater protection. And there's emphatic support for greater protection coming through. And on CADA deployment, one of the other recommendations uh, that's come from the, the uh, Commission, uh, we find a clear but slightly narrow majority for support for the recommendation regarding the ending of CADA deployment, but it is nonetheless a clear majority. So by way of summary, the HSRC surveys, and we haven't done justice to the wealth of data that's been collected so far, uh, in this short space of time, have begun to provide the most detailed evidence to date on public perceptions of the Commission and expectations of outcomes. Indeed, the survey findings show that the procedural justice model that we thought would apply up front indeed does work and does seem to uh, uh, apply to the evaluations uh, of the public um, relating to the Zonda Commission. We found that trust and legitimacy vested in the Commission matter for overall confidence in the Commission, and that confidence in the Commission in turn is shaping views on outcomes in terms of the likely success of implementation with arrests and prosecution and in winning the fight against state level corruption. The public is complimentary about the Commission's gathering of evidence. We saw that through the open ended responses to the good job, uh, uh, bad job performance um, ratings. But again, the, the worry is if prosecution does not meet public expectations. We're going to see a harsher retrospective view of the Commission emerge increasingly. And this will further raise questions about its ultimate value. It will also further erode the um, confidence that the public vests in democracy at large. I think one of the most surprising findings was, um, particularly given the level of national attention that's been given to state capture through the media and other platforms, and the Zondo Commission activities, it's really surprising that awareness is still quite circumscribed. This patterning of knowledge really reflects quite starkly in the divided nature of opinion that we see regarding the performance of the Commission, with a significant proportion of respondents that express neutral and uncertain views because of this broad-based low knowledge. The ambivalence and uncertainty also reflects growing institutional mistrust and concerns about democratic performance after nearly 30 years of democracy in the country. The trends we've seen over the last two decades of the survey we've done has shown that satisfaction with democracy has sharply declined. We see also that institutional trust, a range of core political institutions has dropped by half. That includes national government and parliament. We see also that uh, the demand for democracy, the sense that democracy is the only game in town, is, is, is waning to some degree. 
and the rise of a more fatalistic view coming through. So this matters more than ever, and it matters now. So with those thoughts, we thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben Capelli, for really profound and directional sets of findings there with lots, lots of questions, I'm sure. We're open for discussion now. We have a space for a few comments or for questions ahead of our next section, our, our next session. Yes, please, ma'am. Will you introduce yourself? And there should be a mic in front of you. It says micro. It's the long blue button. There we go. Thank you. Um, I'm Anne-Marie Makudu, and I'm from Duke University. So I'm not a numbers person, so I have to just say that up front, but I am very curious about uh, a few things that I see as contradictions in the, in the numbers. Um, and these are based on some, I think, maybe predictable things about people who perceive the efficacy of the commission positively or negatively in a way um, inverse, I'm, I'm assuming, inversely to their quality of life, actually. Um, and so I'm curious about that large chunk in the middle that you both, both speakers referred to, and the comment about sociodemographics not mattering or not, not coming up in the data in, in very visible ways. Because one of the first slides you showed was precisely of this I'm, I'm making some presumptions here about what the numbers are actually saying, but um, for example, by gender and by race to a certain extent, dissatisfaction, <laughs> um, uh, and by possibly not gender and race, but something else, a, a level of satisfaction with the commission. Okay. And yet you also have somewhere in that first or second slide, something about this being, as you put it, non-poor people, which is a very interesting designation. So I, I guess I'm asking about, well, who's in that non-poor non category and who's in the category of poor, which for South Africa, I would assume, and I think most of us would agree, is actually sociodemographically very visible as one particular kind of thing. So th this for me is where the contradiction arises and it, it made me think a little bit about does it matter in the moment of hashtag Zuma must fall as related to what happens with the Zondo Commission? Um, who is saying hashtag Zuma must fall? Because of course the reasons and motivations were different, but there was a moment of a uh, kind of groundswell with very different kinds of people coming to the table to say exactly that, but obviously from very different perspectives for very different reasons. Um, Thank you. I'm, I hope that's clear what that question is. Yeah. Perfectly clear. Yeah. Thank you. And um, who's going to take it? Um, maybe you can, it should, if you just press the. There we go. There we go. Thank you for that question. I think it's, uh, as I said, on the surface, it looks very contradictory, but underlying it, there are a lot of differential perspectives that come out. We just couldn't represent them um, adequately. And I think uh, the issue about the, um, I just need to clarify, it's not that the race class and the intersection of these different um, attributes doesn't matter, they do. Um, what we found is particularly for that outcome measure, there wasn't a statistically significant effect. What we and the earlier slides that Napoli showed really sh there was a clear patterning on quite a few of those. Um, so it's it's just on the one measure there was not significance, but there was on some of the intermediate figures. So the influence of of race, class, gender, political affiliation, etc., runs through the ratings on trust on legitimacy and in turn has a con confluence on the confidence. So even though they don't, if I look at the direct association between those factors and uh, the social demographic factors and, and overall confidence, 
it's, they are clearly there, but there, there's a strong patterning throughout. Um, the sort of Zuma must fall moment, et cetera. One, one of the most polarizing um, aspects of what we see in the data is related to uh, the former president, his arrest and perceptions of, of issues of, of guilt and accountability. And even in the open-ended responses, um, a lot of questions come through very strongly in relation to whether um, uh, the arrest particularly was, was procedurally fair. Or, um, so when we see some of those fairness ratings, there's a, that, that's coming through. Also the, um, the kind of pattern of support, um, who's supporting them comes through very starkly on social demographics. Um, Natalia, I don't know if you want to add. Um, yeah. uh, thank you very much for the question, ma'am. Um, yes, certainly, as Ben has um, alluded, um, there were definitely social um, economic differences, um, which we could obviously not um, highlight. For example, when it comes to knowledge of uh, the commission, we found that those with self-reported higher levels of education, post matric, for example, were far more likely to know about the commission, and subsequently, were far more likely to um, respond favorably or assess the commission favorably, which then tells us that it has more to do with knowledge um, and access to information. The same goes as well with those who were citing impact and, uh, and assessing the impacts of the commission on state-owned entities, for example. Those again with higher levels of education and those who indicate who self-classified as non-poor indicated that um, the commission, um, the state capture had a profound impact on the commission. And those um, who cited the opposite actually also said that um, they did not have sufficient knowledge. So there are definitely um, social economic um, differences that came during that data. And yeah, we will certainly be representing them um, more clearly in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, yes, I've got two there. So it's Alala and then the gentleman behind there. Green button. Thank there you. Um, absolutely fascinating data and so important and hopefully will inform also processes like the National Anti-Corruption Strategies implementation, just the issues around public awareness. I think where the Zondo Commission succeeded was in terms of raising awareness around whistleblowing and i was very encouraged by that 71 percent figure in terms of awareness around whistleblowing and also the support from the public for greater protection recognizing that so we know that politicians um, are interested in what the public thinks and these are important these public opinion surveys and we need political will and so i'm hopeful that parliamentarians, lawmakers will actually go ahead in terms of strengthening whistleblower protection, knowing that it's what the public, at least from this, wants. And so I think, you know, really the Zondo Commission succeeded in terms of changing the perception and the culture around whistleblowing, which I think is an amazing achievement. Thank you very much. Um, yes, sir, if you could just introduce yourself, please. Forgive me, I forgot to ask. Uh, good day. My name is O.S. Sibanda. I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Management and Law from the University of Limpopo. Earlier on, Minister Nzimande asked the question, to what extent did our participation in the Washington Consensus lay uh, the basis for state capture? I want to relate this to the statistics in the survey conducted by our colleagues. Because then when you look into the Washington Consensus, dogmatically it says or is most for, for the proposition that you know, developing countries must take a what called market-led uh, uh, development strategies. So the question is, out of your uh, surveys, did you have a sense that there, there was a trickle down of benefits from the responses according to people who are saying almost 2 percent of the politicians are corrupt? Or do you see it or that kind of a sense that, in fact, this kind of uh, uh, market-led development strategy was basically indeed the source of uh, state capture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I take your question as well, please? Yes. Yes. 
Michael's fascinating. My question is pertains to um, I think struggling to keep the book, just because the sense of the respondent says that it was a bad job um, because the guilty are or are not held accountable for arrested. And I wonder about how whether or not I mean you can interpret this question, how you phrase it, because it concerns me that there's this conflation between the success in the role of mission as a fact finding body and, and a success in relation to prosecution, which is really up to the law enforcement. And it almost seems to me slightly unfair that the success of the commission comes down to whether or not those that should be thinking of immigration relation are or are not in fact doing so. So I'm, I'm interested in how that was handled. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start with the last question first, if I may. Um, so, Laura, I think uh, we didn't phrase the question. We just said, please give a re please explain your answer in your own open-ended way for why you think the commission did a good or bad job. So there was no, we, they, they wrote responses. We then coded those responses and did the analysis. So in people's own mind and words, they indicated that, um, yeah, I said half a site, said the bad job evaluation was linked to lack of arrest. Um, we share your concern. I think that there is a concern that people expect the Zondo Commission to do everything, including what's not within its remit. <laughs> um, and the fact that the wheels of justice are turning slower in the minds of the public at present is leading to, a, as, as I said earlier, a harsher and harsher retrospective evaluation of the of uh, the achievements of of the commission so it is a worry we see lots of other parallels in south african society like that i think the electoral commission is a good one people expect the, even though um voters and the voting age public ascribe their lack of interest in election in turning out in elections to poor performance by by um the elected they often punish the commission and say you should be doing more um, it's not the remit of the Commission to deal with those kind of um, unfulfilled expectations. So we see parallels with what's coming out with the, uh, with the Commission and the public. It could be that the, the various hats the Chief Justice wears, um, there, there's this interlinking in the minds of the public about, okay, his role is now to make sure action happens in some respects. So, um, but yeah, it, it is a sort of, in, in many respects, an unfair expectation uh, from the public, but they do want to see swift justice. Um, thank you. I'd just like to respond to the question raised by um, the Dean. Um, is Dr. Sanjimala's question was indeed thought provoking, but um, in our survey findings, um, the biggest um, consensus, almost consensus, lies around um, dissatisfaction uh, with uh, service delivery rather than the economic decisions, for example, that were made. Um, there's, um, of course, um, large levels of criticism in some of the decisions that were made. And this comes through in the open-ended responses where we allowed our participants to sort of give us their perspective. What do they think? Some of the dominant themes, particularly in the state capture, has to do with um, the sense of greed um, and accountability and the sense that um, the criminal justice system and subsequently the commission will protect the interests of the rich instead of um, those of the poor. So those were the most um, dominant and predominant responses that we found. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's what we're going to have time for. And may, may you join me in thanking Ben and Kapili for a wonderful presentation. <laughs> so absolutely vital as we head into next year's um, election to understand and think through quite deeply the outcomes of those. Thank you very much. So next, um, to begin to answer the question um, that everybody asks me when I speak about Zonda Commission is, so why is nobody in orange overalls? And that comes out so clearly that prosecution is recognized as the key success factor, even though the commission itself obviously had a, a, could not prosecute. Um, to, to, to take us through where the recommendations are at, please join me in welcoming Advocate Gary Pinar, Senior Research Manager at the HSRC. Thank you very much. Gary. Uh, 
Right, I hope you don't get vertigo as we go from granular to helicopter, um, because this is going to be a very quick overview of institutional reform, um, which obviously excludes people going to jail. Um, I, although I, I heard yesterday, I was in, a, in an online seminar yesterday and heard that Parliament has uh, imposed some sentences, um, some sanctions, let's not call them sentences, on members of parliament who have breached their code of conduct. Um, but it amounts to, I think the two instances that I heard was um, a two months suspension with pay. Um, and the other one was just a reprimand. So um, nothing big to report thus far. Okay. I'm not sure where to point this to make it move. Here we are. The right, the other way. <laughs> okay, so forgive me for uh, referring to Washington um, immediately after the Washington consensus debate. Um, but this member of George Washington's first cabinet, I think, realized that human nature is as it is. I think Narnia was correct in saying we have to make every effort to reduce corruption. We'll never remove it entirely um, but this is a warning for every society in other words so i think it's a salutary warning that it was recognized um, even in the throes of the excitement and optimism of founding a new country that this reality was recognized um, so i don't think we uh, we probably shouldn't beat ourselves up too much we are human but there is a lot we can do. And what I'd like to do now is quickly take you through a few examples of what has been done, what hasn't been done. A quick lesson in WhatsApp. One tick means your message has been sent. Two ticks means it's been received. Blue ticks means it's been read. Most of the time you'll see some of these have been responded to. Um, so I haven't used the one tick or blue tick, but just a, a heads up to that the one tick doesn't mean good news or bad news or a tick box exercise, tick box exercise. So this is really just a summary of what um, the essential core finding for me, at least, was of the Zondo Commission. Um, this was the technique. This is this was how state capture was exercised and implemented in South Africa. Um, and I think we're all familiar with the methodology. Um, and the, st the strategy behind it. Um, it was the essential mechanism of state capture, politically connected people putting, put in, on boards and in the public administration. Um, another part of that failure was that people who had a responsibility to do something did not. One of the institutions that came in for a great deal of harsh criticism by the Zonda Commission was the Public Service Commission. Um, as, as was Parliament, the target of the ire of the Chief Justice. But essentially, there are still no effective mechanisms to prevent cronyism and cater deployment. Um, but there are some signs that there is movement. Um, so some of the, uh, the first point is just a linking point, but then the, some of the recommendations are an independent body then to, to oversee these appointments. Um, to make sure that we have a merit-based process and not a party interest-based process dominating the decision-making and appointments. And then also, not just for um, the boards and executives, but also other senior officials. Um, you heard from the Chief Justice how the CFO is often critical, as is the Chief Procurement Officer. Um, just some management reforms and financial management, especially um, uh, that were recommended the Auditor General um, or to audit all SOEs or other um, auditors can do it if they meet uh, the necessary requisite capacity. Um, and then a return to the original ten intent of the Public Finance Management Act so that um, managers are able to manage um, and not are not constantly 
being um, overseen by their political masters. And you'll see, I, I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, and the Auditor General is reviewing the usefulness of the concept of irregular expenditure um, and to looking at other forms of targeting misconduct. Um, and one of the pieces of legislation that landed in Parliament just in the last month, I think, does portend a clear delegation of administrative and financial responsibilities to accounting officers, so to DGs, heads of department, etc. Um, the other thing that's uh, another area of, of activity recommended by the, the Commission was to professionalize the public administration. Um, to remove this contestation at the political administrative interface, to allow accounting officers to draw the line and say, no, this is not what I'm here to do, and to give them the authority and the protection to be able to say, no, this is where the line is drawn. Um, a number of other recommendations about how to do that. Um, and, but it, it's not just appointing the right people, it's changing the law. Um, and then also doing a certain other things, ethics awareness, ethics training, governance training, and then Public Service Commission has put out a couple of years ago a very useful guide for new appointees um, in 2019, how DGs and HODs should think about the work that they're being asked to do. Um, lifestyle audits have started, we know famously at ESCOM they've started, but elsewhere too, and Psychometric integrity testing is being developed by the DPSA, Department of Public Service Administration, but there is tension between the governing party and the government over these issues. So, um, Cabinet last year adopted this uh, framework for professionalization of the public sector. Um, importantly, it's no longer as it was in its first iteration uh, professionalization of the public service. So it has a broader remit, a broader scope. Um, what quite that will end up meaning is, is to be determined, and it might be de determined by the, the last tick um, on the on, on the slide. Um, but in December, the ANC retained catered deployment as its official policy. Um, however, what has happened since then is that the Public Administration Management Bill Amendment Bill, Public Service Amendment Bill have landed in Parliament. They do address some of these issues. The Public Service Commission uh, Annual Performance Plan says that they expect um, their Amendment Bill to land this year, and that will potentially significantly change their mandate and their powers. They might be the body that oversees these senior appointments and make sure that merit um, is what uh, is the, the deciding factor. Um, but when it comes to professionalizing the public administration, um, this, oh, I think I've gone backwards. I beg your pardon. Um, so some of these are some of the reforms that are starting to take place. Again, the tech doesn't mean it's happened. It just means the message has been sent. Um, the Independent Public Service Commission. So for, for many years, the Public Service Commission has expressed concern that it is not adequately uh, legislated as an independent body. So the Office of the Public Service Commission, which is the department that provides the secretariat to the commissioners, is a department of government. And so there is, as the, and, and, and similarly, as is still the difficulty with um, some of the chapter nine bodies, they argue for their budget through a line function department. So there is a need for that to change. And they believe that those reforms are necessary um, in order for them to perform these functions, which are set out for them in this framework for professionalization. Um, I should just correct the third tick, um, that in the latest iteration of the document, um, or some of the documents, uh, the premier will take over the authority um, for the performance a recruitment, a dismissal, etc. Um, in, in each province, not the DG and the presidency. Originally, that was the plan is you'd have one head of the public administration as a whole. But now it appears that there may be a devolution to provincial level that might be divide and rule or it might be practical. 
um, we'll see what comes out. There is a clear delegation of these administrative and financial responsibilities. Importantly, accounting officers and employees reporting directly to them, so mainly DDGs, CFOs, uh, and the like, are prohibited from holding senior party office in some of these draft, um, and not draft, but the amendment bills in Parliament. And there's a clearer prohibition on doing business with the state, as well as for the first time, I think we've been talking about this Karam for 20 years, the cooling off period. So if you're involved in procurement, for 12 months after that, you cannot go and take a job with a company that was involved in a tender in which you were involved in some way. So at the moment, the wording is quite broadly phrased, but it's encouraging. Um, another challenge is, um, is following up, and the Commission foresaw that obviously it had only begun the process. There is a need for the prosecutions, there's a need for disciplinary action, um, and some of those have begun. Um, they also recommended an independent anti-corruption agency, as the Chief Justice mentioned this morning. But as, as of yet, we don't even have an independent investigative directorate, um, despite that being acknowledged in um, the State of the Nation address earlier this year in February. There's been no further talk of that, apart from some very vague terminology in the, in the NPA's annual performance plan that says this is under discussion with the DOJ. So what will come of this? Um, a lot remains to be seen. The other thing is, is disciplinary action in the public service. And that this is something that the Public Service Commission monitors, um, especially when it comes to financial misconduct. It has expressed concern at the lock, lack of consequences, lack of follow through, the delays, the endless years on suspension awaiting disciplinary action, either being instituted or finalized, the lack of capacity to do that. Um, the Public Administration <coughs> Management Act of 2014 did provide for a capacity unit in each department to be created. Um, at the moment, there is one in the DPSA, and that's in the process of building capacity in each line function department. This is a, a do-over of something that was tried before many years ago, didn't work. Um, but we'll see whether this works more effectively. Um, and then a tracking mechanism, just to ensure that those people don't try and skip bail, so to speak awaiting trial, don't resign, get employed elsewhere, and there's no red flag to say, don't employ this person, they're under suspicion elsewhere. So this mechanism was due to start being rolled out in April. I've not been able to find out whether that's begun. Um, there was a lot of talk in the Chief Justice's address this morning about overall political responsibility, um, what our head of state was responsible for. Um, but no particular charges have arisen out of that. There was also, of course, a, a large number of, of ministers around the president who also um, gave instructions, looked the other way, um, and didn't stand up to their oath, essentially, which is what um, the commission found. Um, they, and the, the commission pointed out that there are these standards but obviously they're not strong enough. They're not having the necessary force and effect. So how do we enforce these? How do we make sure that these oaths are taken seriously? I mean, he suggested this morning some ways, um, including parliamentary oversight, changing the electoral system. Um, two recommendations relating to the electoral system. Um, one is the, uh, and many, many people thought this might be a little bit of overreach, a constituency-based electoral system. But I think, as has been mentioned, um, the ecosystem of integrity, um, the Deputy Auditor General, Mr. Chaoke, mentioned it this morning. If you don't have people of integrity in the community to be elected or standing for office or choosing who to vote into office, that the constituency-based system not really is not really a solution. Um, another solution that the Commission recommended was finding a way to protect MPs from losing their positions um, if they don't follow the party line. Um, I've not seen any movement on that. Um, Parliament should also consider whether it should have a, a portfolio committee for the presidency. We know quite recently that that 
um, wasn't accepted in Parliament, but I learned just yesterday that it, there is a study to a plan for next month to look at good practice models elsewhere. Um, that might be kicking the ball into the long grass, um, but it might be something that uh, reveals something useful. Um, another recommendation was more opposition parties than just SCOPA being chaired by opposition parties, but that was rejected roundly by Parliament. Um, so here is one of the other alternatives recommended by the Commission, was to make it a criminal offence to abuse your, your power. And I think this is targeted at those then who don't adhere to their, or uphold their oath of office. I've not seen any research, but I think this is a fascinating question. It might be, of course, the beginning of a very long process to find a way in which to find somebody um, who looked the other way culpable, at least of negligence. But I think maybe this is, this is something that perhaps is an area for research, as is the next potential criminal offence that was recommended for consideration by the Commission. Um, and this is the, the failure to exercise power uh, as opposed to abusing power. So there's a, a bit of a nuance there. Um, how do we find a, a way to ensure that constitutional and political malpractice is not repeated? So um, I think these are big asks, and I think a lot of research and thinking needs to perhaps be dedicated to how do we make this practical? Um, how do we turn this into something that's enforceable? if we don't change um, our political or our electoral system in the near future, and if we don't change our national character, our value system in a hurry. Um, one of the particular areas, of course, of focus of the Commission was public procurement. We mentioned earlier that that was the primary site for the diversion of state resources, and a number of recommendations have been made. Um, not many ticks to be seen in this slide. Um, or the next one. Uh, there we are. So, but there is there is some talk about um, professionalizing the public service in more than just one way. So, not just employing appropriately qualified and skilled people in the public service, but creating um, and recognizing the value of external accountability outside the public service as an additional layer of accountability. So in other words, I think as the Deputy AG said, people who are registered and accountable to their professional body have had some ethical training and awareness raising as part of their professional qualification. And there is an accountability there. Um, there isn't yet any talk of a procurement, a dedicated public procurement anti-corruption agency, but um, there has been some talk just recently of a, a fund, a whistleblower fund, uh, mentioned just a couple of weeks ago um, by the spokesperson for the Department of Justice that they are considering, I, d I looked for a media statement, but it's not even that official. So there's nothing on record apart from this interview, which was on SAFM Sunrise, if you want to download the podcast, because that's the only evidence I have that this was ever said and this is being considered. But I, a lot can go into this whistleblower fund, um, but there was no talk of legal reform. Um, uh, and I, I, one of the things that did come through Parliament recently was, was the Protected Disclosures Act guidelines for employees that have been gazetted, but about five or six years after the amendment to the legislation that enabled people to make a protected disclosure to more than the initial list, short list of, of constitutional bodies. So if it's taken that long for the guidelines to be published, um, don't hold your breath for changes to the legislation again. Um, the other recommendation, just more about public procurement reform. I think uh, these, are, these are sensible, um, these are useful. We are in a number of um, anti-corruption forums looking at ways in which we can use information that is in the public domain to predict um, where weaknesses lie, where weaknesses um, have exhibited themselves in the past, where corruption is most likely, and where the need for greater transparency therefore might need um, to be implemented. So that's, that's practical work that's going on 
in the anti-corruption forums um, with the assistance of DPME um, and support of GIZ, thanks to them. Um, private sector, let's not forget about them. I think it was important that this takes two to tango. And the bottom line here is literally, I think, jaw-dropping um, that on Thursday last week, fines were increased, maximum fines, I should say, not every fine, but maximum fines for a firm of auditors that is guilty of malpractice or improper conduct, as it's phrased, is now subject to a maximum fine of 25 million as opposed to the previous maximum fine of 200,000 rand. So that is significant. Um, it has been put out for public comment but the, these were the original figures proposed. And so if the example is for, for somebody, an individual auditor who pleads guilty, the fine is still 10 million rand. A firm that pleads guilty, the fine is still 15 million rand. So you don't get off on a plea deal, really. You're still held accountable. But when you're talking billions, maybe this is still not enough. Um, but still, I think this is probably sufficient for for its intended purpose, which is focused on the auditing firm, not the perpetrators. These are the enablers. These are those perhaps who, who didn't do a proper job um, and didn't stop things happening. So just wrapping up, other recommendations made were to amend the Companies Act to allow directors to be, to be declared delinquent. I haven't included a little tick here that um, SAA board chair Dudu Mieni can no longer be a director ever which is great, um, but, um, and the, but I think the opportunity to bring that in sooner, to, to impose that sanction sooner is what's important. Um, then I think an innovative proposal or recommendation from the commission is the duty on the private sector to prevent bribery um, in terms of OECD standards and using the Prevention and, and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act. Um, and then, very, very um, contentiously are recommending a criminal uh, provision in the uh, Political Party Finance Act um, to, to criminalize donations in expectation um, of a quid pro quo of some kind. And I think um, we made a submission as the HSRC recently arguing that this is really perhaps doesn't, isn't really necessary because there is an offence of this kind already in PRECO um, in anticipation of a gratuity or some kind of benefit. Um, it is really taken account of. But um, the, the, I think the reason for this recommendation is that there was a lot of evidence before the Commission that monies circumvented from the public purse found their way into the ANC. Now, um, there wasn't a great deal of evidence on the record that was pursuable, so to speak. Um, in any event, it wasn't an offence at the time um, for people to make these donations. They didn't have to disclose them either. Um, and the donating and, and the duty to refuse the proceeds of crime, a donation that was the proceeds of crime, has only been introduced by the PPFA and only came into effect really very recently. So it's after the fact. So I think. There's nothing stunning in the last slide. I think it's all been said already. Um, but I think the, the concern really is here about losing patience. And I think that's the, the sense that I get is there are lots of things that have started, but there doesn't seem to be a great deal of sense of urgency. The, the, legis the amendment legislation in Parliament at the moment, Public Administration Management Act Amendment Bill, the Public Service Amendment Bill, great. But where is the Public Service Commission Amendment Bill? That's the one that could clean up appointments into the public sector. That's the one that could make sure we really do professionalize the public service. And that's not in Parliament yet. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gary, for an absolutely scrupulous audit. Um, of, a, of an extensive set of, of recommendations, and I haven't seen it done that way, so, so thank you very much. Let's take some questions, and Karam, if it's okay with you, you'll come back after lunch. Then. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Martha. I've, I've moved away Martha from- Martha the whistleblower. No, don't, don't call me that. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I'm rebranding myself. I'm okay. tired of being called the whistleblower because it's served me no purpose. Um, the question I have for, for, for the advocate perhaps is around the Public Service Commission. And maybe I don't have a full appreciation of its applicability because my understanding is that it doesn't apply to state-owned enterprises. And, and what is being done about that? Because you know I've just seen also in one of your slides, I think it's the second last slide, which speaks to the amendment to PRECA, section 34A, and it speaks to incorporated SOEs. Now, I come from PRASA, and PRASA is not incorporated. You know, so, so perhaps maybe one can get a bit of clarity around that, and also, you know, this whole issue of so much emphasis being made on the Public Service Commission Council, uh, the, the Council, and not necessarily um, the rot that happens in the state on enterprises being focused on. Thank you. Just before you answer, may I say that I'm sorry you've rebranded yourself, Martha Ngoy, but Martha has been a singular force in trying to get Prasa back on the tracks. And where the trains are running again, it's your work. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Yes, if you don't mind. Um, Martha, thanks for the PSC and SOEs. Um, this is the unknown um, with the Public Service Commission Amendment uh, Bill. Um, the, the suggestion has been that the, the framework for professionalization of the public sector implies the professionalization of SOEs or and other potentially other organs of state. Um, the Public Service Commission has been identified by that framework as the body that will oversee the process of advertising, recruiting, uh, selecting, interviewing, etc. Um, there are various ways in which it could do that. The current suggestion is that it would vet and draw together a panel of expert, technical experts who are suited for the particular functions um, in respect of individuals they'll be interviewing. So an expert in trains, railway lines, etc. cetera. Um, the PSC obviously can't do all of that itself, but it will ensure the integrity of those interviewing processes. They'll ensure that the advertisements comply with the law, that people who are shortlisted have the necessary qualifications and skills, that the people who are then shortlisted as recommendations to the executive authority meet all of the stipulated requirements um, and have the necessary integrity, and that they have been recommended by the interviewing panel. So the, the, the unknown at the moment is, yes, the Public Service Commission is going to have authority over local government as well. That will now be part of the, the single public service. Um, but how far it will go beyond that into SOEs and other state agencies is the unknown. And that's why seeing the, not just the framework, but the bill is, is so important. Will that authority be transferred in the draft legislation? Because otherwise that will limit, I think, the PSC's ability. Um, and, and therefore the recommendation by the commission um, that this independent body oversee um, all of these people, including you know, CFOs, um, chief procurement officers, et cetera, CEOs, um, that, that would fall by the wayside or would need some other kind of solution. Um, Preco, I, th I, th the, I think the amendment, uh, amending Preco would be easier than introducing a new provision in the PPFA. Um, I, think that's the, I think that's my impression at this stage. Um, at the moment, there is so much contestation, of course, around party funding um, and, and what, is, um, what has been a, a drying up for the larger political parties of political funding. So not just the ANC, but the other larger parties have said in a study that we've done recently for Home Affairs and are currently doing for the IEC, um, they've told us that they've had a cut in funding. The donations that they used to receive are fewer. There's no evidence, of course, on the public record. You can't 
prove that. There are others who seem to be running really quite uh, grandiose campaigns for the local government elections, despite not declaring large donations. There are others, though, who are among the smaller parties who did give us interviews, who said um, the new formula for public funding has been to their benefit, as expected. Um, so rather than the 90-10 ratio, we have an 80-20 ratio, um, proportional and equitable. So the smaller parties do get more public funding, which gives them greater stability and the opportunity to grow. Um, what is still not addressed, though, is newcomers um, into the political realm. So how do, how do we deal with Action SAs, who've done quite well at local government level, they're still not entitled to any public funding because local government is not part of, doesn't form part of the remit of PPFA. So, um, so th there are many things that I think will be reviewed as part of the proposed PPFA review process. Um, the, uh, but I don't want to go, I think, down that, that rabbit hole because I think it is, it's, it's, it's got enough troubles on its own, I think, to not be burdened with a criminal offense that's going to dissuade donors. I think there, there perhaps needs to be a, perhaps more of a duty on political parties and a, a sanction on them if they don't disclose funds that they know are the proceeds of crime. Um, and so something along those lines that already um, is, has been proposed for businesses might be appropriate for political parties. The problem is that some of them have told us that they don't have the ability they don't have the, the, the accounting and auditing ability to monitor and manage their own finances thoroughly. And that's, but other parties have said to us, this is a great opportunity for us to get that right. And we're getting more public funding to do that. So I think this is a, can be seen as an opportunity as well as a threat. Um, but I think that's my rationale for saying, let's use, let's focus on fixing PRECA um, rather than burdening the PPFA at this point. Thanks. Thank you very much. So just I, sh I should tell you about a, a real blue tick to us. There is rare cross-party solidarity amongst political parties that in fact the party political funding rules must be made easier and not more stringent. And they are likely to take that before Parliament. Not this one, but probably the one post the 2024 election.